now. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, this is the group of Jonas Anderson and Eric Jett and Lisette Cherries, and we are uh, giving you a presentation on bilingual education. So uh, I have the first one. This is Jonas speaking. Um, bilingual education before 1968. Sorry, I need to not resize that. There we go. Uh, bilingual education before 1968, um, it's actually tied all the way to the history of education, uh, but we'll keep it brief for the purposes of our, our presentation here. Um, up through the middle of the 20th century, uh, there wasn't a lot of focus on bilingual education. So any Native Americans that were introduced into the school system, um, America is one of the few places that welcomed immigrants, uh, but as soon as they arrived, um, they would try to kind of integrate them into the existing educational system. So this is true not only for the people who are here in front of us, but also for any Spanish-speaking, Irish-speaking, Italian-speaking uh, immigrants were encouraged to speak English and English only. So uh, 1906, the Nationality Act was a law requiring that all immigrants that want to be naturalized, that want to be American citizens, have to speak English. Uh, and that made its way into the school system as well. Two decades later, in 1920s, 34 states had laws mandating that you could only teach in English, no other language. So uh, it was a hot topic even before, um, even before 1968, 1970, when we started seeing the civil rights movements. Um, here you can see, even uh, in our fair state of California, the California Constitution was written that all laws and all official Writings, executive, legislative, judicial proceedings shall be conducted, preserved, and published in no language or no other language than the English language. Uh, and that stayed in effect until 1966. So if you're a citizen of this country, but you didn't speak English, you couldn't even read or understand the laws of the country that you lived in. Um, as the American public school system grow, uh, grew and the population diversified, the original intention was to provide English instruction, period. Uh, and then the tipping point where we started seeing some of this stuff introduced into the American uh, public school system was the Bureau of Indian Affairs rescinding the repression of Native American languages, which makes sense because Native Americans were not immigrants. Uh, and this started revising some of those laws to uh, that were trying to force Native Americans to abandon their original language, even though English was still used almost exclusively in the public school system. Uh, for all um, all literature and all um, curriculum, all instructional material. In the early 1950s, uh, we started seeing racial segregation, and, and the wheel started turning towards uh, undoing some of that stuff that was going on. Uh, prior to the civil rights movement, bilingual education was a, a non-issue. Nobody like it didn't even wasn't even uh, brought up. As the schools started moving towards desegregation, so having schools that were equal for uh, black students and white students and Hispanic students and Asian students, uh, English, lang English learning students had to get over more than just racism that was inherent in some of these systems, but also the language barrier. Uh, so if you have two students, a white kid and a black kid that both speak English, it is possible for them to both get the same education with the same curriculum, but English learning students didn't have that opportunity. So President Lyndon Johnson, former Texas school teacher, introduced the idea of tying a school's federal funding to integration with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. Once the act was passed, it's, federal monies are now tied to integration, but again, because we're talking about bilingual education and not just um, not just racism in the schools, this only did it part of the way to start kind of paving the way for um, truly integrated uh, bilingual education to happen at the public school level. So in certain, certain states, uh, like Texas, prior to the bill being passed, students could be suspended or beaten in school for speaking language other than English. And uh, so multiple sites had uh, both student strikes and community interventions to help precipitate a change in the status quo. So, and this is, uh, you can see here, one of the signs from one of those places. So, pretty crazy. All right, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Eric. Next slide. All right, guys, uh, my name is uh, Eric Jett, and uh, we're gonna go over a couple of the uh, 
the major laws that kind of came into effect and that kind of started with uh, um, the Bilingual Education Acts of 1968 and uh, 1974. Um, these provided, what these two things did is, uh, and it started with uh, President John, um, Lyndon Johnson, uh, provided funding for school districts for non-English speaking um, student programs. Uh, it was kind of the first, uh, you know, attempt to, to start some bilingual education and provide funding for it, um, some incentive. Uh, and then it also prohibited denial of educational programs based on the English profici proficiency level. So just because you couldn't speak English didn't mean that you were going to be denied uh, education. Um, this was closely paired up with the 1970 memorandum, um, uh, which kind of became known as Title VII. Um, that's what we know of, of it today. Uh, also, uh, we have the, uh, the Equal Education Opportunity Act of 1974. Um, and uh, what this did, uh, this is after Johnson, um, but it clarified that appropriate action must be taken to overcome language barriers. What this really did was it kind of gave some, some teeth to the previous laws and, and actually started to enforce those laws so that uh, school districts couldn't just, you know, um, blow off the federal government's laws. Uh, a few of the court cases that, again, kind of gave some teeth and some decision making by the Supreme Court on based on uh, bilingual education. The first one was uh, Lau versus Nichols, and this was in 1974. Um, it actually uh, took place in San Francisco, uh, where this kind of all started. It was, and it wasn't for um, what you might think bilingual education traditionally has to do with, you know, Spanish speaking um, uh, people. Um, but this is actually for Chinese students in San Francisco. There's a very large Chinese population there. And uh, the Supreme Court reaffirmed the law set out in the 1970 memorandum saying that, the, that you can't just say, oh yeah, we're offering bilingual education and not do it. You actually have to show proof that you are, that you are, had those programs in place. Okay, the next court case that kind of in the, it happened in the 80s that really affected bilingual education was Castaneda versus Pickard. And um, what this did is it set in place this idea of uh, um, an LEP program. And uh, these standards uh, included, um, and it has to do with language proficiency, I'm sorry. And uh, what these standards included, set out a, a course for, hey, this, your, your programs need to be uh, pedagogically sound. Um, you need to hire qualified staff. And it, it has to be a system to evaluate your effectiveness. You can't, again, just say, oh, we have a bilingual education program without any proof that it's being successful. All right, and then uh, next court case, and these are all kind of working their way up to the Supreme Court uh, where they're being decided on was Idaho versus the Migrant Council. And the reason this one's important uh, is it established legal responsibility of the State Department um, for education to monitor these programs. This is kind of showing this progression from a, a localized power and a transitioning to a more of a state-run education system where the state is going in and they have the responsibility for, um, for enforcing these laws uh, instead of local um, districts being able to, you know, go different ways with it. And the last court case um, that happened in the uh, in the early 80s was uh, Plyer versus Doe. And this one was actually uh, pretty huge and revolutionary for the education system uh, for bilinguals because it the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that illegal aliens actually have the right to a free public education. Um, and this is, this is the type of thing that's still being argued uh, today. Um, so this was uh, a pretty revolutionary decision by the Supreme Court. And I'd like to... Um, give it away to Lizette. All right. Hi, all. So my name is Lizette, and I will be talking about what happened from 1990 to the present. So in 1998, um, California voters passed um, Proposition 227. So Clinton was really against because he thought that it would intellectually who are immigrants, and this was um, sponsored by Ron Unz, who is a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Believe that English should be the primary, of, well, Proposition 227 believes that English should be the primary medium of instruction for students, and therefore students would receive less 
uh, help in their primary language or their native language. So it generally requires for English learners um, to learn and just have one year of instruction and before they moved on into only English speaking only classes and the parents of English language learners they wanted their children to be considered for bilingual education but in order to do that students had to meet one out of the three conditions English only classroom for at least 30 days and the teachers principals and director of superintendent agree that it would be better for the student to learn in a bilingual program 10 years old or was already fluent in um, a fluent English speaker the bilingual program would only help him acquire another language. And a school would only offer a bilingual program if they had 20 or more students who had approved wa waivers in order for the school to offer a bilingual program. And then similarly, um, Arizona proposed a Proposition 203 in um, 2000, which eliminated bilingual education in the public and children not learning in, in English would be placed in an in intensive one year English immersion program in academic subjects. And as you may know, that is problematic because you don't acquire a language within a year. And the normal foreign language programs were unaffected. About half of the children in bilingual education in California and Arizona from 2001 to 2002 were reassigned to English only programs. And in 2001, the No Child Left Behind Act was proposed and it reauthorized the Elementary and Secondary Educational Act. Focus was to close the student achievement gaps by providing all equal and significant opportunity to obtain a high quality education. And it was based on the four pillars of accountability. Um, and flexibility which which allows schools to choose how to use their federal funds based education which would allow um, schools to implement bilingual education or strategies that would fit the students and it also allowed parent options so in title one of funding would could choose um, the parents could choose where they wanted their school and it requires state to establish an academic standard and testing system so that the students had to be tested um, once a year to establish an APYP report. And recently in this election, there was Proposition 58, which is the English language education. A yes to this um, proposition meant that public, public schools could how to teach their English language learners, um, whether it was an English only program, bilingual education, or other types of programs, and to teach English language learners and English only. And it passed, which was something very good for bilingual education. It is good because it repeals Proposition 227. It removes the restriction to bilingual programs, and parents no longer need to sign waivers to enroll their children in bilingual education. It requires districts to talk to community members about their English learners and the ways that they should be instructed. Okay. We're coming up on 14 minutes, Lizette. All right. So some bilingual programs that do exist are the submersion, where the English language learner is placed into an English-only classroom. You also have transitional bilingual education, which students learn um, are taught in the primary language for two years and then move to English only. And you also have developmental maintenance in which students learn uh, in both languages, primarily in English, in their primary language and in English. And you also have dual immersion programs, which could look like a 90 to 10% in which students are instructed 90% in their primary language, primarily or Spanish. 
every year they're increasing by 10% until they reach a 50-50 uh, language instruction in their primary language and in English. Another form of method is the shelter content instruction, which is also a way to teach English language learners. And it has components are to prepare below on students' background for teachers to make the input comprehensible, also use strategies, allow students to interact with groups, also lesson delivery and the review of the assessments. Okay, real quick, uh, arguments for and against uh, bilingual education. Um, for, for bilingual education, these are kind of the pros that people come up with, is that minor minority speaking populations are, are rising uh, in this country and it will be necessary, uh, speaking two different languages could be very necessary in the future. Um, I'll kind of skip down to, uh, to uh, uh, maybe a different one um, down at the bottom, constant interaction with uh, English speakers. So much of the success of the Eng of an English learner is, you know, having that constant interaction with with people that are speaking English and that speak English fluently. Uh, give them the ability to practice, uh, and then I'll let you guys read the rest of the pros. A couple um, cons um, could be uh, uh, bilingual education can be very costly, um, and that there's a big lack of qualified teachers. Not a whole lot of of teachers um, speak uh, speak two languages as well as learning their content. So. Okay, and then Lizette, can you walk us through saying Unified's uh, stand on bilingual education? All right, so their stand on bilingual education. So because bilingual education wasn't supported and they follow federal and state law, they only, they just recently opened a dual immersion program at Centerville Elementary School. First, um, they either start the program then and continue to the sixth grade and it's a dual language two-way immersion and English and the target language of Spanish is what the other language is in which they are being taught, and it is a 90 to 10% dual language model. Okay, and here's our references. You can click on them if you want to. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for uh, participating in our presentation. Uh, have a terrific day.